McPherson here. To, John McPherson to join us here and to give a talk. Um, I wanted to first, let me just first give a couple of words about John McPherson. He's the Chief Consultant Engineering and Drilling Services at Baker Hughes Oil Field Services. He has 47 years of experience in drilling and first seven years in operations, primarily in remote areas of South America. His areas of expertise include drilling dynamics, downhole and surface measurement systems, drilling automation, geothermal drilling systems, and MWD telemetry systems. He has special interest in developing open platforms and standards to foster competition, particularly in the automation space. He has participated in over 50 technical publications that holds over 35 issued patents as inventor or co-inventor. He is the past chair of SBE Drilling Systems Automation Tech Technical Section, of which he is current board member, and an SBE Distinguished Lecturer in 2016 and 17. He received the SPE Regional Drilling Engineering Award for South, Central, and Eastern Europe in 2018, and the SBE International Award for Drilling Engineering in 2021. So we're very grateful to have you join us, John. Appreciate very much as you talk to us about advances in drilling now and around the corner. Go ahead, um, you have the floor. Yes, thanks for that great intro introduction. Um, let's see, what I, what I was going to do today is just go through, I think, three topics that, that are quite important to, to um, Baker Hughes and, and, and in the industry at the moment as, 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 as stuff has developed. The first one is, is uh, high frequency torsional oscillations and um, on dynamics. And it, it's quite important because uh, basically it's something that we caused ourselves, if you like, uh, by, by really pushing systems. And it, it actually gives a really good story of, of um, how, how we recognize these things and then uh, go through and, and, and address them with, with uh, mitigation tools and so on. The next one is, is automated drilling systems and uh, remote operations, which are uh, leading uh, in getting people off locations and so on. And, and it's where we're putting a lot of emphasis just now. The last one is, is just a, a send out to you all on the downhole uh, um, telemetry bottleneck. So let's uh, go through them and I'll start off with uh, high frequency torsional oscillations. So basically um, this is, this is uh, first noted around uh, the middle of the 2000s as causing downhole torsional failures in, in rotary steerable BHAs. So the, these are BHAs that basically we rotate and they have pads that push against the side of the hole and, and basically we can steer the BHA. And uh, the torsional failures were quite uh, significant. We had 45 degree chevron cracks in, in the BHAs and uh, they were noticed by all major service companies around the same time. You know, Slumberger, ourselves, Weatherford. And um, it's quite interesting. Uh, Weatherford actually published first. Uh, they noticed them in Saudi, in Saudi Arabia. And, and we went in and, and we were looking for a reason to, to explain why we had these torsional failures. We didn't know about the Weatherford or, or some Bajay failures at the, same, at the time. Everything was done in parallel, if you like. And we noticed that we had a flat-lined accelerometer at about uh, 15 G and in a, in a plus or minus 62 and a half G uh, measurement range. These were 50 G accelerometers just overdriven. And uh, we, we assumed, we, we, we said, okay, we're getting this 15 G flat line yeah, on, the, on the accelerometers. So, so this uh, would uh, mean uh, that something was really saturating our accelerometers. So the, the only reason it was at 15 G was that the uh, low, low pass uh, frequency on the, on the accelerometers were cutting off the amplitude of the signal. So we went back in and, and took a look and uh, we see uh, 190 Hertz, if you like on the bottom right there was uh, 15 Gs, agreed with a frequency of about 190 Hertz. If you put in the frequency response of the accelerometers, um, Let's see if we, we go on through here. So that was uh, detecting it. Of course, we then had to take this to 
our management and say, hey, we, we suspect this is what is causing it, but we, we can't really tell. And this is what it looks like. So if we go on through my slides of jammed here, let's see if I can get it moving again. Um, let's see. Okay, so the why is, is really interesting. So the RSS systems were being pushed towards uh, about 15 degree per 100 dog leg severity so they could handle this. And uh, typically before that was about five degree, yeah. So we really had to redesign the internals. And, and when you see a tool, the internals are extremely complex and there's flex components in there and so on. So they can actually bend through 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 this 15 degree and you can see some some of the wells that were being drilled at the time are, are shown there. For example, this is um, the Marcellus, and you can see the horizontal wells uh, uh, and the horizontal portions, and then this high bend, which goes up to about 15 degrees per hundred. And the Marcellus is quite soft, and in fact, um, U.S. land we quite often drill what we call mad wells, which are mile a day wells, so more than uh, 5,280 feet in a 24 hour period, but, but it has caused this complex uh, internal BHA design, which is quite difficult. Then when we go to other areas, get hard rock areas, uh, such as in the, in the Norway, in, the, in Saudi Arabia, in the Permian of the USA, and these had hard calcareous nodules or layers, and, and you had to steer the wells between these layers. And uh, what was happening was whenever we hit one of these calcareous nodules, the, uh, we were getting these high frequency torsional oscillations. So, so it's a reaction of the PDC bit with the formation and uh, which, which causing this problem. So the next uh, step of this was to use the available vibration measurements and, and take a look at them. And, and we, we use, sorry, a visible vibration isolation technique such as uh, the Tomax tool, which is not ours, and we, did, we didn't quite like using it, but uh, we also had an improvement in uh, downhole measurements that I'll go through theory and modeling of this, detection, mitigation, isolation, dampening. So this is the whole vibration problem with, which we uh, actually caused through our tool design by uh, wanting to drill these highly complex wells but then we, we went through, detected it, and now we can mitigate it. And actually we're not now in this last stage, isolation and damping. And we have damping tools now out, out in the industry and some test wells. So let's go on through here and I'll try and explain what we have in terms of measurements. And in Baker Hughes, this is one of the things we kind of excel at is, is downhole vibration measurements and interpretation of those measurements. So we have a, a, a lot of these tools that can, can measure uh, vibrations. Uh, for example, in, in the multi-sense of the bit is a small uh, device, if you like, we can place in there with accelerometers. Um, it's quite high frequency, about 14, uh, 1,400 hertz sampling rate, uh, bandwidth of 400 hertz. Small storage, so, so you can capture, but you can capture images. Our most recent one, for example, is this co-pilot ultra high density, which is shown in the middle there. We have 14 channels at uh, two and a half kilohertz sample rate, a thousand hertz bandwidth usable, four gigabytes of storage, and you can downlink the trigger. So, so there's no need to pull off bottom and do all sorts of stuff. And that has given us really good high density continuous data that, that we have looked at HFTO with, and we can see the interaction of HFTO with other phenomena such as stick slip and so on. And we can really isolate it out from the bending and, and make sure the two are, they may occur simultaneously, but they're not related. And then uh, shown on the, on the right-hand side is our latest approach to, to dynamics, just included it here, which is our Lucida tools, which um, are new rotary steerable systems and they're combined with resistivity tools and so on. It's, it's really a platform, but We've taken our experience with Copilot and, and the measurements there, and, and now have come up with this distributed. We just distributed accelerometer measurements throughout the tool because they're quite cheap to make, and it gives us really good data. And now we have the ability to, if you like, really control what the vibrations we're seeing down home. So the measurement uh, setup, if you like, is really strong at, at Baker and. Uh, 
we're really careful in actually validating all these measurements as they come out. Our standard downhole measurement for validation is actually the Copilot 2 tool, and we validate everything back to that tool. So stick slip, if you look here, is the, uh, on the left-hand side, is the first torsional mode of the drill string. Yeah, it's really low frequency, about a third of a hertz. It's friction-induced, bit or BHA, and, and it's a, a phenomenon of the entire BHA. You have the limber drill string and the solid mass of the BHA. So it's, it's quite well known, and the bit actually stops rotation, as you can see in the five-second uh, snapshot up above. And, and in really severe case, uh, sorry, it, it stops rotating, the torque builds up, it releases, and you really get over RPM, and, and it's shown in here is going up to 300 RPM. And we've seen uh, RPMs in excess of that. And also in, in certain cases, it may actually wrap back, so, so you actually get negative RPM, in which case you actually start to lose the cutter on the bit pretty quickly. So it's a well-known phenomenon. We know how it has limits, it has some hysteresis on the limits, whether you're approaching it from high RPM or low RPM, but we know it extremely well. HFTO is quite different. It, it's a small torsional displacement. It says twist up to about one degree, rides on top of the, the rotary speed. It doesn't, the, the bit never goes backwards, if you like. And uh, very high uh, acceleration amplitude is about 100 G. As you see there on the right, it's, it's seen on the torque as well. And the dynamic torque is superimposed on the static or BHA makeup torque. Yeah? So these are quite destructive phenomena when they occur. And, uh, and uh, it's already said they occur in hard rock, in, in very hard rock, not in shales. So, so something that's extremely dense. And uh, if you really want a research topic, start looking to why because we, we, we have some ideas why, um, but it's never been conclusively proved why. The, 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 it is a resonance phenomenon. It gets locked into the BHA, if you like. The, the, the BHA starts to resonate at this frequency, and uh, the energy just doesn't dissipate back out through the drill bit as it typically would do in, in softer formations. So showing here is, is actually quite clear. Uh, the color-coded going from blue up into the orange is, is, is the high frequency torsional oscillations. Um, uh, the horizontal axis is depth. So, so what you've shown actually is a tangential acceleration, high values of tangential acceleration, but related to HMTO. And uh, top trace, the black one is uh, the density, the bulk density. And on the bottom trace is the gamma ray. And you can see the bulk density, the high density, the high dense formations are really related to this uh, uh, HFTO. So um, in, the, in the softer interval, the shale interval shown in the middle, perhaps the sand at, at around 3,900, there is no HFTO. And so, so, so it's quite interesting when this occurs, then of course you have limits on the RPM, but it's, it's, it's a temp it's a non-stationary, uh, event. It's not something you can put a limit on and say drill above this and, and you'll never see HFT or it doesn't work like that. You encounter the, the hard rock and you'll cause HFT. Now getting out of it, you might be able to get out of it with going to a higher RPM and so on. I'll come to that later. But it's, it's a really interesting phenomenon dynamically. Um, oh, okay, this is dividing out. I'm sorry. I forgot that was in there. So anyway, um, now detection. Detection becomes uh, quite interesting. So if you look at, uh, for example, is shown here the, the, the torsional mode at, at, at 242 hertz on this drill string model all the way up to the surface. And you can show different measurement points. And it really depends, this is an accelerometer, it really depends where you measure on this accelerometer as to what you detect in terms of, of, of damage or danger, if you like, uh, to the BHA. So if you measure at a node, you'd say, hey, this is pretty benign, nothing's happened. You measure just off the node, okay, maybe it's a level three or whatever, but it's still green. And so until you hit the anti-node and you say, oh, geez, now we're up in, in level six. And in actual fact, this BHA is experiencing uh, um, 
HFTO and it's bad for the entire BHA. So, so you'd really want to be able to detect it. But if you run in with a single sensor and you put it in there like an accelerometer, then the chances are you may not detect it. You might get lucky and you might detect that particular mode. So there's been a lot of work has gone into this and in actual fact to, to actually measure correctly, you need both uh, uh, displacement and strain, right? So, so you need both an accelerometer and a strain gauge. And uh, once you do that, then you can extrapolate the maximum or the worst case along the BHA from what you measure at any node. And we've actually done this. We, we have a co-pilot, let me see, four, which has a really good uh, um, strain gauges and accelerometers down there, but really it has two uh, DSPs or digital signal processors running in, in tandem down hole and a lot of memory so it can process the data. So the model is actually done down hole. And, and the, the accelerometer's intention with the model combined to give you the worst case along the BHA, which you can then log correctly as saying, hey, we don't want to, that we're actually on a, on a high frequency torso oscillation at the moment, we need to move off of it. And uh, that's out in the field now, and it shows here um, hard bulk density stringers and, and the detection with, with the, um, HS, the, the strain and, and torque uh, detectors running down hole. They really work extremely well in terms of, of detecting that hey, we're in, in a hard stringer. And really what we're looking at this for is to actually detect it and steer into it. Um, particularly, for example, in Troll in Norway, which, which these are nodules. If you hit one, then you might bounce off and put a dog leg in the, in the, in the well bore, which is not desired. You know? um, so we've run this and, and, and it came out actually only last year. So this is fairly new stuff, but, but uh, it's something we've been working on for, for many years now actually to actually find out how to detect this. So the other one is, is now mitigation. And there's a lot of papers published on this by Andreas Hall. I gave him one of them down below. If, if you want, you can go and read this. And uh, working with the University of Hausthal, they came up with a stability criterion, which is shown there. And uh, let me go one, one and the uh, detalk of a, of a delta RPM is actually shown here on the, on the left-hand graph here. You see these three zones, and what we're looking at is this negative area labeled two, which, which is, as you go up in rotary speed, there's a negative torque, and, and this is what causes much of the instabilities in, in, the, in the down hole. And uh, so they came up with this uh, nodal criterion. They can run it through a BHA modeling and come up with which modes to stay away from and which ones are okay and so on. So th this is a torsional oscillation advisor. We run all our BHAs through this, uh, trying to look to see what, what, what we need to stay away from. And in fact, what, what to look at analyzing if, if we do hit a hard stringer. So this is, this is all quite advanced. And, and what I want to do here though, is, is go through this zone one, two and three with RPM. And it's shown there against stick slip in, in, the, in the charts. Uh, so, so you have, um, for example, you're running uh, at a very low RPM in, in zone two and the HFT, all builds up and it's shown there on the top, the amplitude increases as the RPM. And then as the RPM goes up, suddenly you go into the zone three where, where now you have a positive slope on the delta torque versus delta RPM chart and it decays. So this would indicate, hey, if, if suddenly I, I detect HFTO, let's go up, yeah? And, and uh, also shown on the chart there on the, uh, the graph on, on the left-hand side, you could actually go down but uh, you don't have much rain there. It rains there, it's very close to, to zero. So, and then in the, uh, let's go into the, to the next one and show how this is used. And, and Adrian Ambus used to be at UT, he's now with Norse in, in, in Norway, but he came up with uh, lookup tables, which actually we've known quite a lot of before. And uh, we have the, 
stick slip and HFTO shown on the, on the left-hand side where stick slip is dominant and on the right-hand side where HFTO is, if you like, dominant. And uh, the bottoms of these graphs are showing uh, what you'd expect the uh, rotary speed signature to look like uh, as you go through this. Um, sorry, the tangential acceleration to look like if you go through this, I guess. But uh, no, it's rotary speed. No, it's tangential acceleration. I'm sorry, I, I get confused here. But anyway, on say for example, on the one would be that that little blip on the first, as you, as you've gone through the the HFTO, you'd see see some vibration on there, and then on the second one, you'd see this blip, and on the third one, you have very very stable um, uh, RPM. On the middle one, of course, you have stick slip, so so the RPM is gunning through different cycles, and then four, five, and six. And then on the on the on the graph shown on um, right below the right hand side uh, lookup table or whatever you want to call it uh, stability map rotary speed against RPM, you'll see the different uh, impacts. Whether you're in A, quite low amplitude HFTO, B, and you're in higher RPM, and the, the amplitude of HFTO scales li linearly with with RPM, and then C. Suddenly you've got rid of this stick slip event occurring and now you're just into HFTO and so on and into F where you have no HFTO. So the idea is, for example, you move A, B, C, D, E and F, if, if you like, on the left uh, on the left hand um, stability map to get out of it. But you could also reduce RPM to reduce the effect of, of, of the of HFTO. So, so different mitigation strategies depending on where you are and what's happening and this is really simplified because these limits between stick slip for example in particular has a certain amount of hysteresis so it depends whether you're approaching that limit from the top or from the bottom you know, or from low rpm or from high rpm so that was the mitigation piece and now i'm going on into the um, oscillation piece which is kind of interesting, ah, sorry, the isolation and dampening piece, which is, so we, we, we can mitigate it, but really want to get rid of it. And um, there's two approaches to this. One is an isolator, which basically um, isolates tools above the isolator from HFTO. And the other one is a dampener, which applies to the entire string. If I can run a dampener above the BHA, then I can dampen out uh, HF, the effect of HFTO and the entire BHA. The first one we developed, sorry, was the isolator, as uh, shown there. So all tools below the isolator would see HFTO, the steering unit in this case, but everything above it, which are the weaker tools, would not see it. And uh, I think the next, yeah, here we go. And this is what exactly what an isolator is. It's, it's, it's like a, a dual mass flywheel in a car separating the, the engine from the, from the gearbox and drivetrain. And actually this is the way a uh, mud motor functions pretty much, the, the, the gearing in a mud motor, not, not, not the uh, drive shaft, yeah? So it separates, uh, and here it's used to separate, it acts like a low pass filter, if you like, separating the, the isolate, the excitation in the bit from the upper lying uh, uh, BHA components. And uh, I can't see too well on, on the right-hand side. They have something overlaying here. Let me see if I can close that down. No. Um, so we have the, uh, when we run this thing, when we put this in, it was to address a problem in KSA where we had about 22% failures due to HFTO now with, with our rotary steerable tools, our rotary steerable BHAs. We put this in there and almost out of the box. I mean, we, we started actually going in and, and dragging motors out because we could take pieces out of the motors to build these things, uh, the, the drive shafts out. And, and uh, we went from 22% to 0% uh, failure rate due to HFTO. And, and there, not only that, the run distance uh, increased and uh, we could rerun tools that had been run with the isolator without, uh, so, so, so that meant less uh, tools going through our AMO shops or repair shops. 
our maintenance facilities. So a huge success here. And now we have isolators all over the place. I, I lost count of them. And this was a four and three quarter inch isolator. Going to uh, six inch isolators, we had to redesign some parts and so on. But overall, it's, it's a great success in terms of isolating the VHA. It doesn't remove uh, HFTO. It's still there, but now it's only affecting the, the RSS and they're really robust and can handle it. And we take out the, the tools with tons of electronics and so on that, that, that drop above and, 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 and keep them out of the, out of the vibration range. Um, so, the, oh, sorry, this was the example from uh, KSA with the isolator tool. And as you can see, both the torque and the acceleration there, this is model data which we confirmed with measurements later on. And above the isolator, is, it's almost flat. There's very little shown there. And, and this is um, the actual measured above it um, against our predicted values. We, we predicted what we would get with the isolator. And you can see it's, it's quite good. So, so this, uh, the angular acceleration here actually corresponds to about four Gs. This is, this is shown in, in, in uh, radians per second. But uh, it, corres oh, no, it, is. it corresponds to about four Gs. And the torque is, is, is quite reasonable as well, easily predicted with, with uh, the software. And Dennis Heinisch is, uh, I gave the reference there, it's well worthwhile going, going and reading some of his work. He, he's from the testing side. So he's definitely gone in and, and done this. And we had a lot of uh, fun coming up with the tools in the, in the lab for, for testing this. And I have slides, but I, I, I knocked them out of here just in interest of time showing those tools. So the other one that is the damper that we've just uh, started on, it's actually just uh, be in the field. We've had about 20 runs with it at this point. But the idea here is to put a damper above the BHA to remove the vibrations of the HFTO in, in the string. Um, and we wanted to do this uh, say scientifically, I guess, is to where we knew the, the frequencies that were there and then to design something that made sense. Yeah, I'm not just throw something out of there. What we came up with was this dampener tool that uh, actually has several subs or dampers in there and, and uh, they're joined together with, with connectors, connector subs. And these can be non-mag, mag, depending where they're placed. These are non-wired components, these are dumb. So we typically run them above the BHA. Um, and what it is, is, is we have basically a bio flywheel back inside some viscous fluid. And the idea is, is, is you, the, the viscous fluid shears to that inertia ring and, and dissipates the energy through that. And this is one. These tools have a lot of them inside and, and uh, it's great. Mass production is quite fun with this thing, I guess. Not something we typically do. Um, repairing them with that viscous or, or, or checking them with that viscous fluid is, is not very nice. That gets on everything. But anyway, these are tools. We've now run them. These are our first uh, runs with them. And as you can see, we started off. We had to get used to what they were doing. And I read, by the way, notes that we, we saw an HFTO event um, within the BHA and then the green ones uh, without it any HFTO events. And, uh, but even where, where we did have with the HFTO in the, in the drill string, we get um, very low total accelerations. And, and uh, compared over on the chart on the right is, is the damp dampener runs in the deployed counties in the same size and so on to compare against. Um, and I believe they say there basically is uh, good dampening performance after initial configuration changes. This is the configuration of the dampener here. Um, once we hit set on, on, on this configuration and realize that this is the one that was going to work um, and started to model it correctly, then, then, then we now have something to go forward with. And uh, so pretty good performance, just, just starting out though, and uh, hopefully more runs in the future and we can see exactly what it does. And, uh, but, but this is a, a different approach. Oh, and the HFTO reduction from 32 to 
that was we had HFTO in 32% of, of the runs, like or 32% of the time in drilling uh, before we put it in, and now only 1%, even with these uh, bad events uh, uh, where, where the, the configuration didn't, didn't work completely all of the time. So that was the end of the HFTO story. It's where we are today. And uh, I'm going to completely change gears here for the, for the last uh, right, 10 minutes. I think I'm going to dash through this. And what I think is, is really interesting just now is um, automation and the role of automation in, in, uh, in remote operations. And um, as you see here is, is, is where we've gone in, in, uh, in, in remote operations and automation. So around, right, so it was uh, 1980s, simple wells, uh, perhaps a long time before that. And then we transitioned to this uh, direction of horizontal wells, but every one thing was still at the well site. Much more recently, we've moved to remote operations and monitoring real-time data from our remote operations centers. And um, it's also resulted in a complete uh, change in, in the number of people we have at the well site. And actually there's two things, if I can remember correctly, that happened that encouraged this, that, that caused it to happen. The first was the, we, we automated our, our um, telemetry system, yeah, to, to where it could be unmanned or manned remotely. And the second one was really strange. It was uh, actually the ability to generate a plot with one click, which uh, before we were using a lot of people to generate plots, I guess, at the well site, but in a remote operation center, the, the, the software basically improved tremendously to be able to do this. But uh, so I think just uh, talking off of this, uh, this has shown uh, what we typically did before the number of crew we had on the well site, and then what we have now. And we have rovers, for example, that go around well sites, but, but we really reduced the number of people um, by about 50%. And to be quite honest, I looked at the stats just before this, about 90% of our jobs, of all our jobs worldwide, have a remote component to them. And about 60% of those are completely remote, yeah? So the shifts are run completely remotely uh, without, uh, uh, with only the, the two hands on the well site or sometimes less. And, and it's a real shift and that's globally. Yeah? So some places are 100%, other places are, are getting there, right? The Sub-Sahara doesn't have a, a great remote component at the moment, but it will do shortly. But then again, there's not too many wells. Sub-Sahara. So one thing I want to get across to you all is this complete change of now working in, in the office remote from the rig, which, which is tremendous for us. And, and the, the directional drillers who work there are suddenly moved up the, the decision-making chain. They work heavily with the geologists and so on and directing work. So, so a lot of, of more impact. And this was what actually made those mad wells possible. The, the drilling of, of over a mile a day is the quick decision making in the remote sensor communicated back out to the well site. Um, and basically showing what I was just talking about, uh, the statistics of how we've gone to, to fully remotely operated and partially remotely operated. This is a little bit all the data now. It's uh, since 2020 and uh, I must admit the COVID epidemic perhaps moved this globally, although in the Northeast we were doing it uh, long, long before COVID. So, but it moved it along. And of course, on, on the right side, I, I stole some of these slides here. So this has the, the carbon footprint stuff on there, showing that, hey, getting people off the, off the well site actually reduces it. Actually is tremendously impactful in terms of CO2 reduction. Um, systems automation of drilling. So I don't have much time to, to talk on this, but, but it's a real topic. And, and as I mentioned before, it goes along with remote operations. This is what will move remote operations to the next level of, of getting people completely off the well site. And uh, 
So we have closed loop down, downhole directional drilling, which are, are tools that can go into hole mode, for example, we can downlink a path to hole to uh, an azimuth and, and uh, 3D hole mode, if you like. And then on the surface, we also have uh, surface directional automation, which downlinks into the tool. And uh, particularly in the, in the North Sea, we run these jobs um, quite routinely now, either in advisory or full closed loop mode. And uh, that's shown in, in the center slot there, where we have digital twins running so you can model this stuff in real time. Um, the, the, the computer itself makes up an idea of, of the downlink and sends the downlink itself. The driller is in the loop. He can abort the downlink. He actually has a touch uh, uh, countdown timer so when the downlink goes down and so on. And then on the right is what we're working on now, which is the reservoir navigation piece uh, in closed loop. And that's been worked on extensively in Norway and other areas. And to be quite honest, the piece we've done there is, is the inversion, the real-time inversion. And then the next piece is to conclude it by, by uh, integrating it with, with what we have on, on the other systems. And, and when we're looking at this, it's, it's really important to realize there's a lot of technology involved here. It's not just one piece. It's a lot of downhole tools, surface software, um, resistivity measurements, and so on and so forth. And uh, to make all this happen in the background, um, you know, Pradeep is, 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 is very active in this, which is the OSDU, um, DWIS, or Drilling and Wells Interoperability Standards, to where we, for example, Baker, we don't own rigs, we, we go on rigs. And, and uh, so to basically allow us to go on there and just interface our tools directly into the rig. Um, so that's an industry effort. Um, shown here is, is, is a little bit more focused on what we used to do on the left-hand side with directional drilling to what we do now uh, with uh, the automated systems. Downhole, we have the attitude control, if you like, of the BHA. And on the surface, we have this automated trajectory control systems. And the, the uplink is automatic and the steering parameters are, are, are generated uh, automatically and sent via downlink. And we have the uh, well planning system interfaced into this. So that is where we are. The paper reference paper is given there now. If I remember correctly, it's probably about 2018. Um, anyway, so yeah, 2020. Okay, so we, we were commercial before that, but uh, that's when the paper was presented with the, as it's shown in here. Um, carrying on, this is just an example of where we are in automated trajectory drilling. And, and this is quite interesting to compare. At the moment, um, most of our systems look ahead about 90 feet, if I remember correctly. So one stand ahead, which, which does lead to some issues, particularly on drilling changes. If, if the a uh, geologist, for example, comes in and says we have to drop four feet or turn left or whatever, then that causes a little bit of problem getting back into, into the new well plan or can do. To where now we're looking at controllers that can look considerably further than that ahead. But uh, shown on the right hand is where we are now with, with, uh, uh, with about 156k drilled. Um, so let me... Uh, Go through now really quickly onto systems automation. This goes back to the DWIS part with OSDU. One of the things we did when we started up our automation group was basically said we have to handle our data somewhat differently. So the first thing we did was come up with an aggregation server, which is OPC UA based. So it's, it's, uh, this has had a tremendous effect, actually. No, no matter the, the upswings we go through in the industry, we don't have to maintain a team of you know 100 software programmers to, 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 to keep our interface, our data systems going. We just need two and we can farm the, the, the rest of the work out. So we have an OPC UA data aggregation server, industry standard. All our software keys in off this, all our data comes up through this. We have uh, earth modeling uh, and uh, what's called GSDERT is that's actually our drilling engineering. 
done inside the Earth model, and uh, and it's affixed to to this aggregation server. So the modeling from offline is available to run run uh, at the well site, uh, shown there. The only part that's actually actually in the remote center and at the well site is the sidetrack remote visualization. It can run anywhere, so it just keys off of that. And then, as I said before, we don't do rigs. We, we don't instrument rigs. So what we do is we interface into Novos, which is NOV systems or N MH Worth, which is now called, I'm going to mess up their name, HMH. And uh, as of the 1st of October, and uh, actually 50% owned by Baker at the moment. So, and, and they have drilling control systems that we interface through. And we can move data off, obviously, through satellite and so on. So it's a, an entirely integrated system. That's the idea I'm trying to get across here. And we're putting our modeling on top of this so we can get everything from the office, from planning out to the well site. And also then this interface, since it's OPC UA, it interfaces through DWIS quite nicely. And we, we can start to use the data structures that are coming out of that, that uh, industry cooperation as we go forward. And this is basically the DWIS system shown here, uh, uh, set up by us on, on our systems. On the left-hand side, we have all this data acquisition stuff, auto fluid monitoring, whatever you want going through, through a set of interfaces. And we can then go off to rig equipment, uh, drillers HMI, whatever we need through. And this is basically what we're heading towards, actually, which we have bits and pieces of this just now. But this is very much like the industry standards, and then it allows us to lift standards as they come out and, and plug and play with them. Uh, moving on, what I thought I'd do to conclude here was something that actually is dear to me, I guess you'd say. It's something I have played with almost my entire professional life. Is, is telemetry and how to get the data out of the ground. So, so MWD wasn't around when I started. Yeah, it came up in, in the 70s. First time I heard of it, I was on a rig in, in um, probably Argentina. And I heard of this, so, yeah, somebody's dreaming, you know. So, and, and uh, sure enough, and uh, then I moved into research and realized, oh, this actually exists. So, so that was mud pulse. And now we can do about 40 bits per second raw on, on mud pulse. Yeah, these are what our pulses are capable of. We have acoustic systems which go up to 120. And you have to be very careful here. These are multi hop systems. So, over a length, say, down to past, as you're here, seven and a half kilometers, then, then you end up down at 30 bits per second, roughly. Uh, the next slide shows that the, these can all move if you compress data. And we, we, we use little tricks and so on. But the, the one that can really pump data is actually wired pipe. And that's the NOV and teleserve system shown there going at 57 kilobits per second. Um, when you get into controlling downhole tools, it's extremely difficult to do it with mud pulse, acoustic, and so on. You really want to get up into the wired pipe range. We don't, we, we, we tend to play around in, in this mud pulse range, which actually increased the cost to everybody. I'll come to that in a minute. But uh, shown here is the effective data reach now with, with compression. And um, compression of MWD data is typically around three to one, yeah. And, and uh, but once you get into images, you manage to get up to 30 to one, 10 to one, something like that. Here, I've just used the MWD compression. Um, but you can see now, now mud pulse can go up to about 100 bits per second with compressed data and down to 32 at reach. Uh, sorry, down to 14 at reach. And then the acoustic doesn't change much. If you go back there, we were, what, 120? It goes up to 126. The reason for this is, is, is interesting, that you have to have a lot of forward error correction, a lot of correction coding on the acoustic because you're looking at multi-hops, yeah? So your effective data rate is down pretty close to the, the mud pulse. It, it doesn't buy you too much in, in, in data rate. What it does buy you is you don't need a flowing fluid, yeah? So, so, so production systems or, or MPD operations, great. 
I didn't bother putting compression on the wire pipe because it really doesn't need it. You're able to transmit up, and we have transmitted up for waveform seismic and so on on, on the wired pipe. And just to push it a little bit, Baker Hughes actually has a wired pipe system, which we're trying to get in the commercialized, but it goes up to about a megabit per second. So and then I, I just wanted to touch on this. Um, why wired transmission? Why, why bother with it? Or, but if you want to equipment control for safe operations, you need high volumes for real-time decisions. And a lot of the systems automation, control, performance, all that stuff we work on is made extremely costly and difficult to implement by relying, falling back on mud pulse and other transmissions. Whereas wired pipe, you'd have a high capex and then, then, then uh, you, things would be quite easy thereafter. And, and I showed that on the, on the right hand there, the relative cost. And uh, well, I say it here, dollars per megabyte, yeah? And, and the relative cost of, of the Baker wired pipe versus uh, the relative cost of the, of the mud pulse and, and the high-speed pulses. The Novos system would fit at the top of the Baker wired pipe. So, uh, so it'd be roughly 100 to 200K uh, $2,000 per megabyte, whereas we have systems now that could, if they were commercialized, go down to 10. And then obviously analytics and everything else comes along behind that. So I'm just trying to show where we could go if we could get the industry behind wired pipe. And then of course, once you have the data and the control flowing up, the, the, the really you can really think about, about what's happening and, and, and push systems forward through. So I'm getting close to my end. Yeah, that was my last slide. And uh, I'll try and handle uh, any questions you might have. Um, so I'll uh, keep quiet now. I've just about talked myself dry and, and go ahead and ask questions and let, let me see if I can answer. John, thank you very much for your talk. We appreciate it. I want to give students a chance first to ask questions. Are there any students with a question? All right, I know there's faculty will be interested to ask questions. Any faculty? Yeah, John, this is Eric. Um, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, fantastic that you're doing this. Um, the question that I have is, could you reflect on kind of the application of all that you've shown, right? HFTO control, um, remote operations, and, and um, wired uh, pipe uh, data transmission for, for geothermal wells, I mean, what what could be the importance of all those uh, for geothermal drilling going forward? Oh, great question, Eric. <laughs> um, yeah, so so hard rock, yeah, so so drilling hard rock, you really have to get the HFTO drilled, and particularly if you're going to drill it with with uh, uh, modern BHAs, so you, so you can actually drill at uh, with high dog legs. Yeah, not, not, not just uh, with motors, but really put some high dog legs in the, in the, in the hole and create decent heat exchanges. Um, so, so you'd have to address the, the HFTO problem. And, and to be quite honest, I see PDC bits and, and particularly chimeras yeah, being used in that area. And this would then play directly into that. Um, on, on the wired pipe, that's more difficult to answer, I think, because, but if you have wired pipe and you have a, a directional BHA, you can downlink whenever you want. Yeah, it's not just downlinking occasionally. So the quality of your borehole, you can micro geosteer it, is what I'm getting at. The quality of the borehole increases tremendously. Um, you can actually use uh, downhole seismic while you're drilling as well. And if you had micro seismic on the surface, so the, the advantage to correlating that all in while you're drilling, there must be some applications in there. Um, and on the remote operation side, on, on the this all goes into the quality of the of the well you're drilling, I believe. So so the so the ability to um, just what. Uh, um, neighbors presented today, people off location, but, but uh, a tremendous amount of robotics on the rig. And they, they really didn't take it to the next step with, with uh, the modeling coming 
on behind it. But I really believe wired pipe, the ability to get a lot of data to surface in real time and to do everything as much as possible in real time, not, not modeling and then, then drilling and hoping you get it close to the model. Yeah, and then going back in and seeing why not but actually, actually bringing the whole lot together. Um, so, so a very systems approach. Good question, by the way, Eric. Uh, one, one near to my heart. <laughs> and, and, and John, this is Silvio. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, sure. Um, so, so following up uh, on, on, on Eric's question uh, about geothermal, you know, you remember our discussions about telemetry and, 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 and other technologies. Um, so, so what is the limit now for, for the NOV uh, pipeline uh, in terms of temperature and, and what it will take for us to go a little bit higher? Oh, I, I can't remember if there's 125 or 150, but it's, it's around there, perhaps 150. This is a real problem with, with all these systems. Yeah, with, with MWD um, is, is the, the 150 limit. But uh, we, do, we do have, for example, uh, Eric and others know this, we, we do have the capability to, we, we, we have MWD tools going up to, to 300 where we can flask, if you like, the electronics and, 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 and cool them while they're down hole. Um, the, the other thing though, the sensors are still at environmental temperatures. So, so you really have to look into that and there's materials and there's different people looking at, at that piece there. On the directional side though, you can package the, the in fact, we have done package the, the, the sensors up to 300 Cs. Batteries, if you're looking at battery BHAs, then, then they, go up to, to 125 on the rechargeable, 150 at the moment on non-rechargeable. However, there are things called thermal batteries, yeah, salt batteries, and they go up really high temperature. And uh, we experimented as part of the DOE, a DOE project, it's written up somewhere on the DOE site, in bringing that temperature down. And we got it down into the 150, 125, 150 range, if I remember it correctly with some really weird salt chemistries. And these bottle, the, the, and that was rechargeable. And these um, salt cells are really neat because they're completely stable. At room temperature, you could, you could hammer on them and nothing's gonna happen, it's just salt. Um, but but at, at, at temperature, they become liquid, the salt becomes a liquid and it, starts, uh, it, it acts as a battery. So well lo worth looking into. So, so, so if you to answer your question, it, it's, um, electronics, flasking the electronics and, and handling the temperature. And, and there's other ways of handling temperature. I mean, I mean we, we use conventional PHAs to drill geothermal wells just now. Uh, so, so you can cool with the fluids, use chillers or whatever on the surface. So to be quite honest, I think it's just a, a gradation and, and everybody's running around saying, oh, hot temperature, we can't possibly drill at that. Hey, we do it. So, so, so. And, 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 and these little problems are really nice ones to, to solve either in universities or, 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 or within the company, within our own research labs. And to be quite honest, we, for, we, we farm out a lot of research to, to universities as well. Does that help? Yeah, excellent, John. Thank you very much. Always a pleasure to, to, to see your presentations. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Silvio. Any other questions? Yeah, um, I just have one question if you mind. So. Yeah, my, my name is Mohammed. I'm a boss dog in the rabbit team. So, Mike, I have two questions to you. The first one, when you spoke about the F, uh, HFTO, and you mentioned that the companies who observed this phenomena was Schlumberger, Baker Hughes, and Weatherford. Um, do you think is there is any relation between their type of RSS because we are using push the bet technology uh, based on my experience? Uh, is it related to initiating the HFTO or it is only related to the bat? No, it's, it's not, not related to the type of, of uh, RSS technology push or whatever. It, it's related to, to, to the internal design of the rotary steerables to, to, to be able to take that bend. Yeah? Yeah. So, so whether you have a rotating sleeve, a non-rotating sleeve, whatever, whatever you have internally to there, there's a, there's a, the designs are extremely complex with flex subs and so on. Um, 
and 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 it, it's that's that design that leads to to the susceptibility to to torsional lateral frequencies yeah and, and, and the behavior and and, and also the, the the drilling into to these hard stringers which we observe yeah you can you can take a, a any rotary steerable assembly and drill in shale or, or drill in the Marcellus Utica up in the northeast and you, you never see HFTO. You go into the Permian and you drill between those um, those diagenetic uh, calcareous layers and if you drill into them you, you're going to see this, this behavior and, and it does destroy BHAs extremely quickly. Um, yep. So I, it, it's related to the bend and the internal design on, on all RSS uh, technologies, not, not to the, the RSS method. Okay, um, thank you. And second one is regarding the isolator. Uh, I don't know if I understand you correctly. So when you show the isolator and you mentioned that above the point of the isolator, it is going to completely de decouple the vibration or remove it, but um, the problem is still below the isolator and all the expensive equipment is still below the isolator, the RSS or, or maybe some LWD. So how this technology solves the problem? Oh, yeah, oh, so, the, yeah. So, so, so yeah, the, the, the isolator is on top of the RSS. Yeah, so, so, so the RSS sees high vibration, but it doesn't fall apart, it keeps on going, yeah? But the, the, the weak electronics, the ones that are susceptible um, to, to, to the vibration are actually, you know, with, with the number of connections, there's a lot of connections in an MWDVHA are all above the isolator. So, so that's quietened down and, and we've run this and, and like I say, we went from 22% failure rate or something to zero in KSA and we measured it below the isolator as well. We put a measuring device in there and sure enough, it's all over, it's really seeing a lot of vibration, but it's not falling apart. Thank you. Does that help? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. I, uh, uh, hi, John, I had a couple of questions, uh, 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 two questions actually. Uh, uh, one, uh, uh, I, I'll, yeah, I'll ask both the questions and then you can kind of an answer. Uh, uh, for, for HFTO suppression, uh, recently NOV published a paper where they talk about uh, redesign of bits to uh, uh, suppress HFTO. Uh, I would like your take on that. Uh, and the second question is basically, um, Baker has a, a phenomenal amount of technology, right? And, um, uh, and I know the, uh, 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 the economics in US land is quite different from uh, North Sea and uh, Norwegian operations, uh, let's say, right? So. Uh, uh, do you find it difficult to get acceptance for a lot of these technologies on U.S. land? Those are two, just are two questions. Okay, so so the first one. Bit uh, the bit design. The bit, the bit, yeah. So so I haven't read the paper. I I suspect. Okay, so so so. so I suspect that. Um, a different shape of cutter, or for example, on 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 the on the drill bit is not going to to remove the HFTO, which is actually locked. So 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 I, I suspect it's the HFTO is caused by by the hard the calcareous layers. Yeah, so the the for example, the, the, the strain law or the pressure law and, and, and those rocks are completely different from, from a shale, yeah? So I suspect that it, that's related. This is what I said, this is, needs to go out to university to explain why this happens. But I very much doubt whether changing the PDC configuration and so on is going to get rid of HFTO. That's, that's my own feeling. So, so I haven't read the NOV paper, I need to go in and see it and so. Um, the other one was, uh, yeah, to test stuff. <laughs> That's what you come down to, or to get. It's easier to start. We found it easier to start our technology in Norway 
or in or in KSA, for example, or in Saudi, than it is in the US. Does that help? <laughs> um, that, I mean, uh, this is phenomenal. Yeah, like, like I said, this is phenomenal technology, right? Uh, but in the US, it looks like uh, they always want to adopt the cheapest way, which ultimately is not, I mean, cheapest initial cost, which ultimately doesn't necessarily map to the overall lowest cost, right? So uh, yeah, uh, yeah. mindset is very difficult to break. Yeah, no, no when you're dealing with, a, with a, an expensive piece of equipment, you're e exactly correct. And, and I remember a few years ago sitting with uh, some, some oil company people, and they said, you know, MDB tools can only be costing, you know, twenty or thirty thousand dollars to develop. And I said, geez, <laughs> these things are expensive pieces of equipment. And and you're right, in, in the in the US land, they will typically go for the for the cheapest part. So so what we tend to do, like the isolator was was tested initially in, in KSA and now they see the results and so now they want it yeah so, so so it gets into US land alternatively though some of the stuff does come out of US land like I was saying in the Marcellus and Utica it was where our remote operations came out of to be quite honest that that's where it really had its first success and that wasn't a research project that was operations people having the tools and suddenly realizing hey if we can couple this together with that then, then it will give us uh, the ability to run these jobs remotely. Uh, while we were sitting in the back shop, you know, all coming up with these weird, wonderful plans and how, how we we're going to do remote operations and, and automation. So some good stuff does come out of that approach. Huh? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Well, thank you very much again, John, for joining us to share your knowledge and experience. Um, thank you to all the students and faculty who've joined in. Um, We'll head, go ahead and finish officially. If anybody wants to hang on afterwards to discuss and so forth, that's fine. Hey, well, thanks a lot for, for allowing me to share what we're doing. And uh, if you have any more questions, then, then just drop me an email. It'll be fine. Awesome. Appreciate that. Thank you, John. Okay.